Simon, maybe? No? No, no, I wait for Raymond. And Malika, maybe, no? Okay. So, <coughs> uh, <ta> <laughs> So yesterday we were in uh, Africa, in Tanzania, and today we are switching to um, South America, okay? Different uh, geodynamic context. We will be uh, in, uh, in the Andes, okay? The place where you have the subduction of the, the Pacific uh, Oceanic Crust. And um, I will present you some study we did with uh, another of my PhD students. We share, shared PhD students, Sophie Demouy. And uh, on the another thematics, which is uh, crystal growth. So uh, you remember the question uh, I, I explained yesterday about are we still creating continental crust or not? And uh, the idea to go to the to this area in in, in 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 South America is because there is active subduction, typical continental subduction. So this is the Arequipa basalt. Uh, we are in the Andes, not the highest part of the Andes, but what we call the coastal basalt. Um, and the thematics of this. Uh, the, the PhD study of, of Sophie was crystal growth, mainly, okay? Are we still producing continental crust? So you remember this diagram I show you yesterday or maybe just yesterday. Uh, we are, so this is a volume of continental crust and accumulated, accumulated volume of continental crust, okay? So, and we are, according to the study we have on zircon mainly, okay? There are several hypotheses uh, that you can find in the literature about how the con Earth's continental crust was made at, at which rate. So there are models saying that everything was done in the beginning and then stabilized. Okay. So model that you are creating a lot of continental crust at the beginning and then you are gently continuing to create continental crust regularly now. Some other say that the majority of the continental crust was created around three billion years, okay? And some saying that you have a continuous production of continental crust, and some are uh, saying that uh, you are, we are increasing the volume of continental crust production. So how to solve this kind of problem? Uh, one of the, um, the targets should be to uh, go in a place where we are believe creating a large volume of magma, which are uh, believed to, to build the continental crust. So, <coughs> uh, generally, above subduction, um, uh, mantle is melting, and uh, it does not give only granites, okay, with the mantle melting, not directly. The main uh, activity you can see above subduction zone is uh, volcanism, but as I say yesterday, there are a lot of magma which are in place within the crust that either we don't see, or thanks to uh, erosion and uh, and surrection, we are able to sample now. So the process in subduction zone, you certainly heard about it. Okay, you have dehydration and metamorphism on the of the oceanic plate, then the fluids are triggering the mantle melting. All these melt rise up to the surface. Some are under plate, under the continental crust. Some, the temperature can also trigger the crustal melting. I, I, I speak about all the process we can imagine. Then you have also some generation of what we call TTG, which are believed to be the prosolite of the continental crust due to the remelting of basaltic material, okay? You cannot make TTG by melting mantle, normally, except plagiogranite, but it's a very specific case, okay? 
And then here you have a part of the subcontinental mantle. You have this mush zone here. And then you can have volcanism and plutonism. OK? So in the last uh, ten, 10 years and 20 years, the idea about uh, the generation of granite in, in subduction setting changed a little bit. Before, there was only the people were believing that there were magma and it, there were only the end of the f fractionation sequence. And there were s those who were also believing that it was only remelting, anatexis, in fact, remelting of the previous uh, lithologies. And <coughs> specifically in the subduction zone, there was this notion of deep op zone published, for example, by Catherine Hannen, and the uh, very famous paper from uh, Ildret and Morbar in 1988, uh, which defined the notion of mash, mixing, assimilation, storage, and homogenization. The idea behind this process is that the heat is uh, provided to the juvenile by the juvenile input of magmas coming from the subduction zone and can may remelt the deep mafic continental crust to produce either by mixing or not granitic liquids okay so if this is, this is there is no mixing this is pure recycling of the continental crust not really pure because there is underplating of ma of magma and uh, if there is mixing then you have an input into the continental crust due to the input of arc volcanism. I will come back on this model. Okay. <coughs> About the timing of the of the um, continental crust genesis, uh, there was also this uh, idea published by Dussier in 2001 about what we call flare-up event. Flare-up event is people were uh, is coming from the fact that people were dating granite okay i told you in a continental environment we are making much more dating than geochemistry people they're dating and then realize that in some coastal chain above uh, subduction zone we have um, catastrophic event very quick short event where we creating we are creating a large volume of granitic bodies and they can they were able to define some cycle in a single area of production of large volume of granitic bodies and they call it flare-up events and so all again this the idea when we went to south america in the arequipa region in peru was to see if maybe we don't have this kind of process, flare-up process, in South America. So, what, where is our study uh, area? Uh, here you have the Andes, the Pacific Plate, with the subduction of the Pacific Plate, the, okay, the Peru-Chile range. You have some ridges also. I will not talk about ridge subduction today, but we have some the, the, the very specific case study of uh, ridge uh, rise uh, ridge subduction and you have what we call north volcanic zone central volcanic zone and southern volcanic zone okay a characteristic with a large occurrence of big big volcano okay and desitic mainly and uh, we in our case we were focusing on the coastal batolith in the south southern part of the Peru region, which correspond to the northern part of the central volcanic zone. So, before going there, there was some idea about how you can uh, do crustal growth. There is, and it's very difficult to reconcile, I, ass I assure you, this the tectonician idea, where everything about crustal thickening is due to shortening, 
okay, due to the movement, relative movement of the subduction plates, okay, you get shortened, you can be in a compression regime and then thicken the continental crust. That's a technician view of crystal, crystal thickening. And there is a magmatic view of crystal thickening is putting magma and introducing magma, large volume magma, large volume of magma in the continental crust. Very difficult to reconcile, and it's very difficult to discuss with the tectonician when you are going from the magmatic point of view and they are going from the tectonic point of view. So that's the main idea about the two major factors which can participate to the crustal growth or crystal thickening, even if the tectonic in the tectonic view there is no really coastal growth, there is thickening only. Okay, so where is Arequipa? Arequipa is the second city in, uh, in Peru, very, very beautiful city, surrounded by a very nice volcano, which rises up to 6,000 meters high, you have snow on the volcano, and the city is completely white, made of white stone, because it's made of by a tough, tough stone, and it's a very nice city if you have the chance to visit. I, uh, and uh, the weather is beautiful, one day for rain per year, but if you have plenty of water, because the water is coming from the Andes, the high Andes, so you have plenty of river, plenty of agriculture, but no rain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Arequipa Batolith is located there, okay? This is what we c part of the coastal Batolith. Uh, so the idea about working on this area is, of course, to tell some, some story about the generation of this coastal Batolith. You know what is a Batolith? Batholith is uh, several, with it's, it's made of several lacoliths, we call, okay, of granite. Uh, and also, of course, if we can solve the problem here, then extend our idea to the rest of the coastal batholith. So Sophie went there during the six first months uh, of her thesis. We sent her there in, in, in Arequipa. So, uh, because I was not her PhD director at start, she had two PhD directors, but they fight each other. And so at the end, she finished to do the PhD with me because uh, it was she was not able to work with them. It happened, okay? Uh, so, uh, she she but she spent six months there uh, because, you know, we have a collaboration, IRD uh, collaboration with Peru, so there are some facilities for people there. And also, uh, our first uh, two PhD director were the technician and the geophysicist, geodynamic dynamician. And so for them, you have to spend six months on the field before being a real geologist. So she spent six months there. And in fact, I went at the last, the last two weeks of her stay to ed help her to pack the rocks and to check the, f the, the, the field, etc. So, huh? mm. ah, so. This is the Arequipa batholith. Of course, it's made by several intrusions which have different timing, okay? So I will uh, briefly explain you uh, what they are. You have three major faults affecting, okay? The Agua Salada here, the Lucia fault, and here the Cenicienta, and sorry for my Spanish, I learned German when I was at school, so my Spanish would be terribly bad. Worse than my English. Uh, you have three main plutonic units which have been defined uh, with this name, the Marfic unit uh, in red, Tiabaya in pink, Linga, the largest one here in uh, uh, beige, Yarabamba in yellow, and the Chapicurason in, in purple. And all these granitic bodies are in place in a metamorphic soil, and sometimes they are covered by juratic sediment depending on the age of this. Uh, the, map is, the map we had at start was relatively good because there is a big copper mine in the middle of this area, which is located there. And thanks to the copper mine, we have also some facilities to explore the, the granite with the mine geologist, okay? So it's uh, mainly copper and manganese uh, which are exploited there. So that's the cross-section about what we believe to be the structure of the Arequipa Batolith. 
So in uh, order of, uh, is the, the, the order here is the time order. So first you have the subtractome, of course, in brown. And then the, um, the mafic unit, the first one, Jurassic, was in place. Then you have the fault acting. Then the Tiabaya unit, uh, which is Cretaceous. Uh, Linga, uh, Lucia fault, and the Yarabamba unit, Linga, Yarabamba, which are more uh, Maestrician Paleocene unit. Okay. So you will see with this study and the study I will present tomorrow or maybe today, we don't know, according what to what Raymond said, that it was a hazard that finally we find this kind of result on, on this uh, uh, pathology. Because the goal of, the, of Sophie, the objective or our PhD, was to do magnetic fabric on the granite, what we call ASM, you, you, me you measure the magnetic fabric of the granite, then you can have an idea about the eye and placement process of this, uh, of this different unit from one to each other, you know? Because the granite is fo fossilizing uh, some orientation with this mineral when it's freezing. It's not something g related to uh, uh, magnetic uh, positioning. It's something related to the deformation process. And so when you do a ASM study, you have to sample a lot because you want to have some vectors of movement of the, mag of the magnetic minerals in within the unit. And uh, if you want to have some vectors of the movement, then you need to, to do a lot of samples. So, so she sampled around three and the sample for three succession. There is no published paper on granite on a single batholite a geochemical paper. I for my knowledge, that have sampled 300 samples in a granite. When you are a geochemist, especially when you're dealing with granite, normally you do dating, you do a little bit of, of geochemistry, but you don't sample 300 times the same unit, okay? You don't need 25 samples on a single unit, which was already mapped, etc. We know it's the same age. You take three, you date, and that's all. You confirm that it's Cretaceous or Jurassic. But this time, Thanks to, in fact, the ASM study that she did not perform, okay, <laughs> we had 300 samples. And then when she ended after one year crying in my office that uh, oh, I cannot do my thesis, my PhD director are terrible, and uh, I, I will suicide, and went back to my mother place, uh, blah, blah, blah. I say, oh, 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 you have a very nice sample set. We maybe we can do geochemistry because nobody do geochemistry in granite so extensively. So I say, I train you for the clean lab. You have three and a sample. Let's go. Okay, but are you ready to spend one year in the clean lab? <laughs> okay. And then we perform trace element, major element, on this three and uh, not on the 300. I have to be honest. We did 100 and one 200. Not dating, not 200 dating, 200 uh, geochemical, raw rock geochemical studies. So, and Thanks to her, we had plenty of samples from a single unit. Let's see what's going on in the geochemistry of granite in a single unit, which is supposed to be homogeneous. So about the mineralogy, petrography of this sample, we are in a typical uh, felsic magmatic series that we can find in a subduction context. We go from what they call mafic. For me, it's very silicic, uh, when you, I, because I'm a guy from the mental, but they call it mafic. So typical gabbro diorite with plagioclase, clinoparoxine, fibol and sphene. Intermediate uh, diorite, quartzo diorite, quartz, plagioclase, and fibol, biotite, carfelspar, sphene, CPX, etc., to a real granite. And the characteristic of this kind of series is the systematic occurrence of amphibole in the granite. Okay. That's very, very specific to granite series that you find in a subduction context. Of course, we do some dating because there was some date, but not that much. And we have to be sure, especially for the isotopic study, that we are dealing with some, the age which we already published. So she did uh, laser ablation dating. Uh, also, she dates several samples in the single unit. And thanks to her dating, she was able first to confirm that the map was correct, but even she changed some 
uh, you know, some uh, uh, area, the border of some area and the limit of some area change thanks to the, the age. They are one, but it's very difficult, you know, to see the difference between a granite and a granite. Huh? Okay, it's when you are on the field, it's only granite. Even the contact between the, the, the lacolis, you don't see them. So, but she were able, thanks to the day, to confirm that part of this was not, in fact, uh, the linga. It was the other one, etc. I will not go into detail in, in this. But you will see how we are using the, the ages. And, as I told you yesterday, because one uh, of our PhD director, the one which remained, because I, 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 I one remained, he was still uh, our, our PhD director, and the other left Toulouse, in fact, and so he was a technician, so he said, well, we should do lutetium afnium, we should do afnium on zircon. So she performed some afnium on zircon. And again, see the diagram I showed you yesterday, we saw some changes in the juvenile affinity of the zircon in the, in the sample set. But of course, you have plenty of dots, but this is plenty of dots on a single sample, okay? So we have few uh, comp in comparison to the large number of samples we had. So we have some nice idea that there is some change in the isotopic uh, nature of the, of the source, but still we did not have enough. So this is why we continue to do the, the trace element. So the idea behind though the, the our PhD subject was to really um, tell some story about coastal growth and the emplacement of the pasolite. My approach and our the approach we developed together on with doing geochemistry was to understand what are the process behind the generation of granite if it is on the AFC, if it is peritectic assemblage, remelting of the crust, mixing of two, something we did not know. Okay? And then uh, this is we went with the idea that we want to trace this kind of process, the famous mash uh, process, that you have a root where the magma are mixing, gener generating maybe, and then evolving, mixing, in place, react, etc., etc. And can we trace this with the trace elements and the isotope? So, first major element. Uh, here, and the color will be the same for all my presentation. This is a report of all our sample sets in a classical task diagram with uh, the Jurassic uh, uh, activity in blue. Okay, so going from here to here, the Cretaceous in green, going from here to here, and the uh, my Christian Paleocene activity going from here to here. So first thing, thing that you can notice is you have almost all the type, the different type of sample in all the uh, period of activity. Of course, you will see that some are more granitic, uh, especially here. Some are more mafic especially in the Jurassic, but still you can find all the fractional crustacean, the fractionation uh, trend in all the different units. So in average, we can say Jurassic is more mafic, uh, Master and Maestrician is more granitic. About the trend we can have with major elements. Here, the samples are reported in the classical uh, Archer diagram when you have a CO2, okay, fractionation index, and then you report the other major element. So you have the same color, and on gray behind, this is all the database we have on the granite along the coastal chain in, uh, in, uh, in, in South America. So you see our sample set is not something totally different and something weird that you don't find anywhere in, in South America. This is fitting the fractionation trend uh, along the, uh, with the other sample and with 
the so aluminium, iron, okay, magnesium, sodium with the buffering here, and you see that effectively the blue one are more mafic, and the some green and yellow one are more are more um, evolved. And something I will insist here because I will come back on this notion. You can see that even if you have a nice fractation trend, when you go up to the mafic part of our sample set, then the spreading is you have a large range of composition. The spreading is more wide, okay? And you will see that it's not only for the major element that you can see this. About trace elements. Uh, okay, so trace elements, it's a little bit tricky to, to present. I will not present you the, the spider grants, okay? You see a lot, you saw a lot of spider grants because they are all the same. When you plot spider grants of the granite, from a Arequipa region, from Mafic to the granitic bodies, you have a slight change in the concentration, but they are all the same shape, okay? They have the shape of a granite in a subduction setting with a classical niobium tantalum anomaly. So we are sure that we, there is a subduction. Okay, we knew before, but uh, okay. And, uh, but they are all the same. So what we prefer to do is to plot them in the same uh, fractionation diagram, okay, with a CO2. And what we see? Normally, if you have fractional crystallization, simple fractional crystallization, you should have the same type of line we have for major elements, okay? When you fractionate, you increase the concentration. When you fractionate, you increase the concentration for rarer elements, okay? for barium, for yttrium, and rubidium. But the problem is, it seems that, of course, there is a trend of enrichment of trace elements with the index of fractionation, but also there is an increase in the range of value you can find. So the more you are fractionating when you're evolving, the more heterogeneous in terms of trace elements you are, whatever the period of activity. Totally independent for the period of activity, okay? It's defined by all samples, okay? Here you have a line, a line for blue, and here you have a potato. Remember potato? Okay, a potato. This is a problem. That means that this is not simple fractional crystallization. So if you think about it, then you see, okay, granite, we know it's maybe not a simple product of fractional crystallization, even if the major element fits very well with this kind of hypothesis. That's why we go for trace elements. Strontium, of course, goes the opposite because strontium is compatible in plagioclase and feldspar. And this is some theory that you're fractionating a lot of feldspar. So that's why strontium is going down. But still, it's a classical behavior for a trace element. Now, isotopes. When you, have a when you see this kind of spreading and you have no explanation, so what we do is isotopic determination and say, okay, maybe the isotope will trace the source with a nice mixing, etc. And then we can explain the threading because there is mixing or contamination or whatever. So we report the isotopes in a diagram. Of course, all the data are age corrected. We are dealing with different period of activity. The only way to uh, compare the isotope between the Jurassic period, the Cretaceous period, and the Pliocene period is to correct them for ages, to go to the initial value when they were generated. We did not have the age of all, on all the sample. In fact, you will see later that we have some, some way to find it, but still, we had the age of the cartography, we had the age of the unit, so we can make some edge correction directly from sample and we compare them to the other basolites we can find in this area. So let's start with the oldest one, the mafic, the blue. They have a strong crystal fingerprint. This is mantle, you know, remember the mantle uh, array, array here in niodymium st uh, strontium? This is a morb, this is the bulk silicate earth, okay? Average of the earth, this is the continental crust. They have a significant crystal isotopics in nature, and a very large 
spreading in terms of isotopic signature too. But still, if you do the average, sitting around there. Cretaceous. Still a large spreading, but you have, you s it tends to be homogenized. You have a large number of samples plotting, surprisingly, in a place where the average or all the other will, will plot. Okay? So, another period of activity, a more o homogeneous isotopic signature. And if you plot the Maastrichtian Paleocene signature, then most all of them are here. Same average isotopic composition, very little spreading. This is something you cannot see if you are not measuring 200 samples or even 20 samples from a single unit. This is why people working on granite, they say, okay, we have interaction between magma and the crust to explain the spreading. Because if you measure only three samples for the Jurassic, you have one here, one here, and one here. Say, oh, it's very heterogeneous. If you measure three samples of Cretaceous, you have one here, one here, and one here. You will say, oh, it's very heterogeneous. And the same for Maastrichtian. So thanks to, in fact, the approach he had for sampling for some totally different purpose, we were able to see that in uh, our lunge, uh, large sample sets, there is some logic during each type of uh, tectonic magnetic activity. So then we end with a problem. We have sample granite, which are, of course, more mafic Jurassic and then more granitic uh, in the Paleocene. But still, we have uh, uh, a dispersion in the trace element content with fractionation. OK, you see, you remember here, dispersion. homogeneization of the isotopic signal with fractionation. If you consider that, and timing, huh? okay, there is timing. If you consider that each period of activity is more mafic or more, uh, more um, uh, granitic. So what kind of process can explain that you are uh, uh, dispersing your trace element content, homogenizing your isotopes. Very difficult. AFC? AFC can explain the dispersion of trace elements, but you should have a dispersion of the isotopic con composition. Mixing? Mixing tends to homogenize everything. If you mix, at the end you have a single composition. Peritechnic? Assemblage uh, ent entrainment that the Clements and Stevens hypothesis I present some yesterday. You know, you are granite is not a melt, is not accumulate, but is taking and carrying with him the, uh, uh, the some some uh, source mineral uh, during his ascent to the surface, and this is why you can explain the heterogeneity. Yes, but if the heterogeneity is carried by this min peritectic mineral, then the isotopic heterogeneity should be carried also by the peritectic mineral. And we have a buffering of the isotopic. So what kind of other process we can explain uh, that can explain this? And with Sophie, we end after a second year of thesis with all our data, because she spent one year in the clean lab doing our data. And when we start to plot the data, we say, we did not understand anything. So, as always, when I don't understand anything, I say, we come back on the basic. Plot your data in an isochrone diagram. Forget about the age correction. We don't have the age of all our sample. Plot them in the isochrone diagram. This is why the first day I told you the basic is the isochrone diagram. And it's very powerful. So, Let's report this data, so no edge correction, nothing, just you take your data from your mass spectrometer, your database, and report them in an isochrone diagram. I take the example of the strontium isochrome diagram, and then you report them according to their color, period of activity, and you check what's going on. So what's going on? You have a large spreading, of 
course, if you have a large spreading of edge corrected, you will have a large spreading in, in a isochron diagram. You have the blue here, Pacific, with a tendency like this. You have Cretaceous, plenty are here, some samples are defining some line, and you have the majority of the maestriction Paleocene. So, you remember what can be a line in the isochron diagram? A line is age related. Isochron or aerochron in this case, the slope, I have an age. Cool. Age is, uh, a line is process related, mixing. I have a liquid here, I have a liquid here, I mix them, and then I have a spread. And, and that's it. That's the only two process which can give you a line in an isochron diagram. So let's check what have, are the significations of this line. Maybe I can draw a line here, okay, in a strontium diagram. But if I draw a line here, these samples are older than the age of the Earth. I'm not sure. Uh, I can draw a line here and then measure, measure the slope, saying this is mixing, maybe, but let's check the significance of uh, of, of the, the age. Fortunately, on this, there is some here. There is one here, one here, one here, one here. We have some uranium lead dating. So we check the concordance of the, the aesochron age and what we have measured on this sample. Yeah, they were the same. Oh, this is age related. This is not mixing. If one sample is a sample, we are defining an aerochron have an age which is the same as the one the aerochron is giving you, then the, s the line is age-related. Same for the maestrician. All these samples here, we have 10 ages on them. They, have, they give the same age you are uh, given by the, the aerochron. So the line in this diagram is, uh, is age-related. So why then all this spreading here? The spreading in the father-daughter ratio for the same type of sample, okay? This is the same type of sample, this is granite. Normally, they should have single rubidium strontium ratio and then a specific age. Thanks to this, you see, when you evolve, when you move to high silica content, fractionation and rubidium increase. When you move to high silica content, fractionation, strontium decrease. So you increase the rubidium strontium. So in fact, all these samples here are granite corresponding to different steps of the in the fractional, in the fractionation history. Same rock. And more than this, they are sharing the same parental liquid. You remember the signification in the Iocron diagram? This is the age, and the intersection with zero is the initial isotopic composition. So we have a series of granitic bodies. We have a different magmatic history. They encompass different fractionation history. This is why they are spread, but they are sharing the same parental melt. Okay, that's what I told you. Is this is a Paleocene isochron, and we have plenty of samples here dates at the same age. Of course, we are not dealing with the precision we have with uranium lead. We have uh, 60, we have 65, we have uh, 67, we have uh, etc., etc. But still, this is the same period of activity. Regarding the variation and the here, it's the same period of activity. So what we did is cool. We have a single uh, event or multiple events which are sharing the same source, the same parental melt, so let's calculate the parental melt. If it's the, uh, there is no AFC here, it's single frac fractional crystallization normally. Even if people believe it's not fractional crystallization, let's check the fractional crystallization process. So we develop a program with Sophie uh, to be ready to, to find the parental melt on the consistent series of, uh, in terms of isotopes of granite, okay? 
uh, it's not still published, but it's a nice program, and uh, because you can, you can, so you can fit the data. So this is the fitting of the data according to fractional crystallization. And the beauty of this program and uh, uh, the mathematics behind is not mine, and it's my father. I collaborate with my father to develop this. Uh, it's, uh, it's a method that consists to use uh, three consistent trace elements which are fitting each other and to use them to find the possible scenario to incrementally find, you find the fractional crystallization um, percent, the global partition coefficient and the initial concentration. And you see when you use this program and you do the, after you do the reverse uh, modelization of the liquid, you find a very nice fitting with our data. So we have the primitive belt. Uh, we have the fractionation law. Uh, we have the initial isotopic composition. Cool, we can check uh, what's going on with all our da sample data sets. So here we report in different diagram uh, fractionation, fr crystal fractionation uh, law. Uh, uh, using the coefficient we determined previously. So see, the red are the consistent Maastrichtian samples. They are fitting nicely, this law here, for uh, heavy earth elements, for rubidium, for strontium. And of course, we check with neodymium that the, the, fact they are the fact that they have the same parental melt is still consistent. So the idea is to uh, as a function of the fractional crystallization index here to look if the neodymium are all the same. Because we take the hypothesis that the strontium, they share the same parental melt, neodymium isotopic composition should be the same, okay? It works, okay? But the problem, it doesn't work at all for the other sample, okay? So we saw that in uh, for a specific period of activity, we have a single parental melt for all the granite, even if they have different fractional crystallization index. So what about the other? So for the other, uh, we, we, we have a problem because uh, we had a problem because uh, we check, and I show you the, the modeling on uh, some days ago, we check AFC, assimilation, assimilation frac uh, crystal fractionation, and it was not working. It was not working principally because uh, the more heterogeneous sample in terms of isotopes, so the one which should have uh, suffered the more as contamination by the continental crust, are the more mafic. This is tricky because normally the more you fractionate in the assimilation fractional crystallization process, the more you, you will be contaminated. So the more the, the isotope should be contaminated. And it's not the case. Uh, the peritectic mineral assemblage, I told you, it doesn't work because you homogenize the composition. So, in fact, what is the process which can homogenize a composition, isotopic composition? This is mixing. If you mix, you mix, you mix, you mix, at the end, you have a, a unique product. And, of course, you have also to fractionate because we see some fractionation. So, we develop first a model that we call the crystallization front, where we are mixing a crystal component, typically the crystal anatexis here, and the mantelic component, which is related to the melt coming from the subduction zone, and we are mixing at a random, uh, with a random ratio, and all this can evolve by fractional crystallization and maybe mix again in a second state. In this case, you have mixing, you can homogenize, and you have fractional crystallization. So, that's the result on this model, if you plot it in terms of concentration with a fractionation index, so you have mixing, crystallization front, mixing, crystallization front, etc., etc. And then, of course, because you have fractional crystallization and mixing, you homogenize the isotopic composition and you are also homogenizing the strontium concentration. But still, it's a nice mathematic model, but certainly it's not really what's happening. You don't have this kind of process with two gentle evolved magmatic systems. We evolve separately. They mix somewhere. Sometimes they don't. Oh, they, they evolve separately. They mix again. This is nice to explain the, the mathematic, 
this is not geologically realistic. But still, in this idea, we can explain the spreading of the trace element concentration uh, in this kind of Archer diagram. Because you have the spreading as, as more, the in fact, the fractionation ev evolution, the fractional cr crystallization fractionation is not evolving like this. It's evolving like this. Because if you s isolate the Maastrichtian sample, for which we are sure this is fractionation only, uh, we demonstrated before, this is not assimilation, we have a single, and then they fit on a line like this. And this line can be modeled by fractional crystallization. And the spreading you have like this should be re related to mixing. You have anatexis and mental component, mental melt here. And if you mix them and you homogenize, you are reducing, like a triangle here, the concentration. And then at one step, you evolve by fractional crystallization only. And it works with the other trace elements too. But still, it's a mathematical point of view. This is not realistic. So in our thesis, with Sophie, we develop another approach, which was more um, uh, realistic according to the MASH uh, process. In this approach, the idea behind, I will not get into detail uh, in this, is everything can mix. Everything can evolve. The only way you can maintain something for fractional crystallization is that it mix. Uh, if it doesn't mix, it cannot evolve. So. Uh, this is a way to reduce the number of the possibility. And this is also the way to explain that all the isotopic composition we have in uh, our sample set are not arc magmatic related. This is not what we find in the end design. This is too much crustal. It should have interact in one way with, with the crust. So if we don't find the pure pole, we don't find the crustal anatectic pole here in our isotopic signature means it cannot evolve alone to give some granitic liquid. We, we don't find the mantelic pole signature in the granite, so it cannot evolve alone to, do, to give a granitic body. It has to mix. And so the basic condition in this model here was you have to mix to survive, okay, as a, man, as a mental product. And then if you have this condition, then you homogenize the signature, but not on these products. If you freeze at this step, then you will have, you freeze at the first step of fractionation, so which can correspond to the mafic unit, the very um, uh, the, the primitive melt product, okay, mafic, with a little of fractional crystallization. Then if you freeze them, you will have a large heterogeneity of composition because you have different increments, okay? Cool. So we compute this model, and then that's the result. So here you have, uh, again, the strontium. So it's a Boolean random way. We uh, use a random uh, counter uh, production of uh, mixing stuff. You, know? you randomly uh, inject in the program the percentage of mixing. You randomly inject in the program the fractionation until we reach a certain level where we know that we don't have any heterogeneity, so it was uh, given by the Maastrichtian sample. We randomly so inject, and then we calculate what kind of solution we can have. And then, it again, it can fit the spreading we have here in the trace element concentration, and the uh, spreading we can have in isotopic composition. Uh, OK, but it's nice. We can explain our, our composition. We have a nice model, OK? The problem behind this is you are dealing with very different period of activity. Develop a model where I, we, which is made to explain like if we have a continuous magmatic theory in one period of activity. It's not the case. We have Jurassic, big time gap, Cretaceous, small time gap, and then Paleocene. So you have to demonstrate yes, that you are 
you are you are watching a single uh, the, the the behavior of a magmatic system at a different step of its maturity okay this is the way we propose that the system is working according to the different period of activity depending of the temperature of the continental crust when you are when again the subduction is under the Arequipa region after a large period of quiescence okay no magmatic activity if you inject a new a large amount of new melt in the crust the crust is cold it's difficult to to melt and then you have the production of the various magmatic bodies which doesn't mix that much each other okay they mix a little bit mixing assimilation they mix a little bit they can give gra granitic bodies okay and but still you can find the trace of the different source in the magma because you did not homogenize them too much but if you leave if you have a long period of magmatic input under the crust and also you are changing the tectonic regime then you can thicken the crust tectonically and also increase the temperature and develop a zone where you can uh, a zone where you can store and homogenize the magma okay and if you homogenize the magma then you reach this step and you homogenize the isotopic signature and the rest will be devoted to crystal fractionation only or fractionation only that's typically what people propose in the mash model but without the support of the data that i present to you today and this was the main result of the phd um, phd uh, of, of sophie so still it's this is not published yet i still have the paper to send because uh, we want to make some adjustment but this kind of process finally it's a compromise between pure anatexy uh, a pure fractional crystallization of uh, of um, anesthetic melt and uh, it explains the the spreading of the signature that you cannot the spreading or the homogenization of signature that you cannot explain with the assimilation fractional crystallization which was which is most of the time it uh, proposed to explain the spreading in the isotopic composition but you see in this case there is homogenization and not spreading for part of the isotopic composition uh, and what also this model can explain is the flare-up because at one step you reach a certain a certain thermal uh, um, situation of the crust so that you can develop this reservoir and this reservoir is a big factory of granitic liquid production okay because you can maintain a deep reservoir very hot sustained by the, the heat provided by the magmatic input from below and the local conductive heat you have in the base of the lithosphere and maybe maybe uh, maybe it's wrong like all scientific study but maybe when you have a flare-up event and you are creating a large volume of continental crust you have this kind of scenario you have a mature hot deep uh, thick continental crust which can also create more continental crust and the question is now what is the mixing what is the mixing index between anatexis and this if there are more mental melt if there are more crystal melt are we still producing continental crust and i don't have the answer <laughs> i hope you will have the answer huh, if you continue this kind of study but still with the model i present to you today i don't have the answer to explain to really to constrain the uh, quantity of melt which is uh, which is uh, provided to the continental crust by the anesthetic melt 
and the quantity of melt which is produced given to the continental crust by the remelting of the continental crust. Simply because it's a random, we use a Boolean and random here distribution of mixing. So still we are continuing, of course, to think about this, this issue, but we did not solve the problem yet. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Sometimes you have some xenoliths, but very few. And uh, no, no, it's very, very thick crust. And so, uh, and because here it's a real, the, the homogenization, the especially the last production, here it's a very nice factory for. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the problem with, uh, with uh, xenoliths is xenoliths are. The witness of assimilation in this kind of model, there is no. Ah. No, no, we ask, but in the Jurassic, what we find is not xenolith, we find inherited zircon. Yes. And we don't find any inherited zircon in the, in the, in the maestration, for example. Uh, so we still have another type of evidence that there is not, it's not totally mixing during the cold uh, period of activity. It's there are some assimilation and you can get, but in maestration, no nice magmatic zircon, no inherited zircon. And, um, and on the field, what surprised me when you, when you sample the unit is, uh, you see, we. I did uh, I did this cross section here with Sophie. Uh, this one here, okay, in the Linga unit. A very long uh, walk, but uh, they are sitting there. You don't see any 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 change on the field between this. We s we know that it's different lacolith. This is because this is not a single parental met which create all that because there is a, it, the time of activity is uh, like uh, around three, five, six million years. So it's the same, uh, it's the same magmatic uh, chamber, if we can say chamber, it's the same uh, homogenization zone, but different pulses of magma which come out and they are in place it within each other, impossible. Yeah. No, I have nothing on the field. I mean, nothing. Well, I did not came back. Maybe, maybe now I have the data. Maybe if I will come back on the on the same uh, cross section, and I know that the sample number twenty one and the sample number twenty three are sitting one here and one here, then I will really be careful and check the the if I see something on the field. But uh, frankly. When we sample and we cross cut on the linga unit, you have the impression that you are in a single unit. And this is why certainly people were sampling like uh, randomly sampling three or four sample, because it's a homogeneous unit. You think you it look like an homogeneous unit. And uh, so you take in 3D runite to say I will have the isotopic composition of this and then uh, I date them and then okay. But uh, you will not get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah, between the mafic mafic unit, of course, of course. But in the, for example, in this paleocene here, no. On the field, uh, we don't see any any evidence of. Uh, and uh, yes. But you know, thanks, thanks. The approach was not a geochemic, geochemical approach. Maybe uh, if I have 
went on the field with Sophie at start to study this kind of outcrop, I would not have sample 300 samples. Yeah. yeah. And you will see tomorrow, it, it was the same for the study I'm going to present tomorrow. We find a nice result in terms of geochemistry, and the purpose of the study was not at all to do geochemistry. But this is the approach we are doing with uh, Georges Kölner, especially in Oman. This is George who told me that you, you need to have a statistical view about some sample, some, some outcrop, when you don't find any particular petrographic heterogeneity. When you have a huge massif of peridotite, don't sample two, try to have more, because maybe there is a heterogeneity related to some process that you don't know, you don't suspect. And Yeah. Yes, but maybe you, you don't suspect, you know, for example, the, my PhD student who just ended his PhD about dunite, there is nothing which looks like a dunite than another dunite. And in Oman, we have 300 meters of dunite cross-section. The approach we develop, okay, we don't see anything on the feed, expect some time, you have some uh, layers of gabbro, okay, so you stop, you sample them, the rest is massive dunite. So what you do, we have our GPS, and if and we do a cross-section like this, and every 10 meter in highness, we sample. You don't see anything, so maybe if there is a variation, we will be able to see. Maybe 10 meter is not enough, maybe it's too much, etc. And this is the approach Georges developed with his former student, Benedict Abedi. They did a cross-section, and they saw a large variety. And then and, and we, we continue to have this approach with my PhD student, and you know, he published a free paper about this because there is some process that you cannot suspect. As a petrologist, we love to have to see some changes in the mineralogy to, 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 to see the mineralogical change uh, according to a petrological process. But sometimes the geochemistry is more, uh, you cannot see on, on, on even on the, on the thin section because it's related to uh, diffusion, fractional crystallization, etc., and, uh, and the petrology. Of course, laser ablation, you will see it, because it's also uh, even trace elements on wall rock, but thin section or field geology, sometimes you say, okay, uh, it's a granite, you go 20 meters, it's a granite, 20 meters granite, okay, I have to, I go back to the car, and in this case, she's... Mm. Yeah, please. I mean, you, it, it, it's very, it costs to go on the field, okay? It's, it it costs cost money, so you, when you go on the field, when you are on the field, and you have the possibility, of course, if shipping is not extraordinarily expensive, you have the possibility to take 20 instead of two, take them. You never know, maybe you will not use them, but uh, maybe it will be very, very interesting. Of course, it's for me, it's simple to say that because I have the facility in Toulouse to do a lot of analysis. But still, I mean, uh, maybe in the future, I mean, you store them, you classify them, you, you make some thin section, you say, well, we'll see. Maybe one day, well, I have some grant for one PhD student, a collaboration, then we can take out this sample set and then see what's, what's inside. And So of course it's a hypothesis. Huh? I don't say I'm. I have the. This is a solution. This is a hypothesis which can fit, which fit my data. Then, I'm sure if I send the paper to the guy in South uh, Africa, they will say oh, it's bullshit. <laughs> okay. No question. More question. So thank you. So uh, Raymond, I, I I do my.
नहीं तो प्रेजेंटेशन मध्य हाँ हाँ तो खूब हेवी आयामें तो प्रोजेक्ट करो नहीं रिडंडंट हो Good morning. Uh, we are presenting uh, the Indusophiolite uh, belt for inputs from the participant as well as the faculty. Karmakar sir will uh, deal with two ophiolite belts tomorrow that is the spontang ophiolite and his work with uh, in the Dras region and I will talk about the work that we are trying to do in the Nidar ophiolite belt. Needless to say that uh, this is a group work uh, done uh, by by several people, uh, Malika is here, uh, Akshay Kelkar is here, Taira, and uh, so it's a group work, and I am just having the pleasure of presenting this. Uh, this view that you see is of Nidar, and Nidar was previously mapped and uh, sampled by. Shrikantaya previously, but uh, if you notice that global warming is a boon to ophiolite studies in the Himalaya. And 13 years back, uh, this was the scenario where you had snow covered mountains. Uh, the snow has vanished and uh, a lot of area is now exposed to new mapping. So it's a very prelim preliminary work that we are doing over here because the outcrops are very much new to the Indian terrain and uh, no previous work has been done on the exposures. So we are, this is work in progress. As you all know that uh, ophiolites in the Alpine Himalayan belt occur because of the obduction of the oceanic crust, mostly Tethian oceanic crust onto higher Himalayas and we have several belts of ophiolites across Pakistan into China and uh, into the Nagaland Manipur ophiolite belt and into Andaman. Uh, today we are presenting on, on a small part which is, if you notice, uh, is depicted, sorry, is depicted here as the Somorari ophiolite, that is where Malika is working, the Spontang ophiolite, and that's where the Dras ophiolite is. And of course, you have the, the Khoistan arc, uh, which is part of Pakistan. Uh, we have Bibal complex and other ophiolites there. And of course, we have the Zangwe ophiolite in Tibet. 
we have another small ophiolite uh, in the Malajor area in Uttarakhand. But we are concentrating in the Indus ophiolite belt and the next map uh, shows you the Indus ophiolite belt. So we have the Indus suture occupied by the Indus river. That is Cargill for reference. So we have Dras just off this Spontang ophiolite which happens to be the world's highest ophiolite and of course a long oblong nidar ophiolite most of it is related to the to the ophiolitic melange but towards Handley and nidar we have the ophiolite right uh, the eclogites that sir presented uh, were around this part the somorari dome and the eclogites are restricted to this area so they are juxtapositioned this is the Ladakh batholith which is scalcalkaline 55 million years and then you have the Karakoram dextral shear zone out over here and uh, the Shiok suture zone over here in which there are some ophiolytic melange not, not this is an exaggerated map but we have uh, one over here uh, which uh, Hemant is uh, studying. There probably appears to be a secular variation between Jurassic and Cretaceous ophiolites, but we are not sure. So what are ophiolites? You already know what are ophiolites. They encompass the crust mantle sections and Michel and many of the previous speakers have already explained to you in great details about ophiolites. So we come to the Nidar ophiolite uh, which is accessible through the Mahe bridge area. So this is the ophiolite that is accessible in this parts, in the central parts and in Hanley. So that is the Google image. Uh, we have concentrated our work in, in Hanley. Uh, then around Rongo which is a place over here. Then we have a continuous section over here in the Nidar valley and of course we have it in the Sumdo. So I am presenting facets of what we have done uh, so far. So we are seeing the, the handley part of it uh, where the Indus river lazily meanders across the thrust sheet of the ophiolite. So that is the river, the Indus river over here and we have peridotites and of course on top the basaltic flows. So we have peridotites at the base, we have gabbros over there and we have basaltic flows on top. They are obducted nicely. So the petrography of the Hanley plot shows that most of the textures are protogranular, porphyroclastic with large aluminous spinels, right? Most of them are Hasburgites, but few dunites are also there. And we find that the spinels are basically exolving from the orthopyroxenes, probably relating to the reactions or garnet spinel transition. So they are quite deep over there, exolved. We come now to the central part. This part is not accessible because this territory is dominated by Chinese occupation. So we have, this is the proclaimed border, but uh, the actual line of control is around this place. So accessibility to these uh, parts of the ophiolites are very restricted, uh, both on the southern side as well as on the northern side. So we have concentrated our work in the Nidar stream. Uh, it is still restricted but um, still accessible. So in the 13 years that we have worked over here uh, collectively, we have been able to map uh, only say 5 by 5 square kilometers of, uh, of terrain. It is difficult. It is around 6,200 meters above sea level. Uh, the previous map, as you can see, does not distinguish between the true 
uh, categorization. So peridotites, dunites, pyroxenites, uh, volcanics, these more remote sensing based uh, interpretations. That part is now remapped and we have a continuous section of obducted sheets uh, that we have mapped containing uh, dunites, uh, uh, Habsburgites and intruded by gabbros and pyroxenites. So that is the, the southwestern part of the ophiolite uh, with a lot of thrust sheets. This is the first year now all of this is exposed that is the Somorari dome it is metamorphic and this is where the ophiolite starts. So we have isolated dismembered ophiolites and in one section we have continuous ophiolite with several thrust sheets. So they are peridotites, they are mostly Habsburgites on this side and of course they are dunites on the other parts of, of the ophiolite. So we did conventional petrography and modal analysis and we classified rocks according to what they are. We have dunites, we have Habsburgites and of course they are intruded by olivine websterite, uh, Michel showed some very good intrusions, veins and dikes uh, of olivine clinopyroxenites and of course orthopyroxenites. Unfortunately uh, the, the samples from Nidar are not very fresh. Most of them have been serpentinized and uh, we had to spend a lot of efforts over the 13 years to get samples that we can work with. So most of that is serpentine and clinopyroxenes with, with spinel. But we have good exalt pyroxenes, clinopyroxenes in which there are exolutions of orthopyroxenes. So the major oxide does not work over here because it is remobilized. Fortunately we have a lot of chromite mineralization in this ophiolite uh, and a lot of studies have been done. Uh, some, of, some of his teachers have done Balram and on the RE and of course of these peridotites. So you have, you have classical peridotites that are layered, odiform, they are disseminated layers. You find that there are Schlieren's bands and disseminations of chromite. Petrographically they are all uh, chromites in the sense that they are non-aluminous chromi and they show occluded silicate structures like this. That is basically olivine and this is BSC image and chromite and you have some places very few patches of nodular chromite. But most of the chromite is sheared because of tectonics. We have sheared chromites over here and of course startlingly when we seen some of the chromites uh, they were of course podiform in the SEM but some of them had rounded structures like that and that led us to think that this could not be chromite. So we investigated and we found that some of them are actually vanadiferous chromite or colsonite indicating that there was some amount of fluid flow and metamorphic effect in concentrating the vanadium into the chromium uh, into the chromite. So we did preliminary work with it uh, with whatever we had and there was not much to work on and so Akshay was instrumental in plotting these and uh, we have two varieties over here across a large area, uh, one with lower FO content and the other with higher FO content, especially the olivines from the occluded silicate structure had higher FO numbers indicating that they were more pristine. And the chromite chemistries include chromite to herthinites 
okay, and also magnetite, which is not plotted over here. So, in the famous Dick and Bullen, we find that there is, we modeled the chromite and olivines and found that there are different degrees of partial melting that resulted in variations in the chromite and residual chemistries under low f oxygen fugacities. Same thing over here, uh, using the olivine and the spinel, we get 10 percent to about 25, 30 percent extractions. What was interesting is that the parts from Hanley uh, showed residual peridotite characters, while the parts in Nidar, the ophiolites, the chromites in Nidar showed that they were related to metamorphism. So, we plotted a diagram of the FEAL and CR and we found that the sections in Nidar that is towards the south uh, west are having greater degrees of metamorphism tending to be towards, towards granulite, but the other parts have undergone low grade metamorphism from the green schist to upper green schist facies. Uh, interestingly in the field, uh, that is the vice chancellor <laughs> and uh, he is standing on the petrological moho. So, you have serpentinized Hasburgites down and the leered gabbros on top. So, we have a section where we could within within the errors determine the petrological moho. Uh, these peridotites are intruded by several pulses of pyroxenites, two of them over here and several small to very large intrusions of gabbros. In fact, 60 percent of the Nidor ophiolite area wise is gabbros and uh, Unfortunately, we do not have the sheeted dike complex developed over here. That is that's the enigma in this ophiolite that the sheeted dike complex in majority of, of the ophiolites in the Indus suture zone or elsewhere along the Indian margin are missing and that remains an enigma that needs to be solved. But overwhelmingly the gabbros predominate the ophiolite sequence. So, we undertook the classifications, traditional classifications of the gabbros and we have as I said previously olivine websterites, we have hornblende gabbros and of course, we have sorry, we have hornblende gabbros and uh, we have uh, norites uh, that are intruding these and some of the norites are leered. Uh, while the hornblende ga gabbros are isotropic. And of course, small patches of plagiogranites have been reported from this these gabbroid complexes. We also have uh, the third variety which is a layered gabbro uh, and a pyroxenite, but uh, we are still classifying its true identity. So, again the problem was getting fresh samples. So, most of these are serpentinized. Uh, we have a set of six good gabbros that we can use for geochemistry and we have done and they show typical cumulate textures, uh, mostly add cumulate. The entire complex is intruded by post that is the 55 million Khardung volcanic dikes. These are andesite dikes. Uh, not related to the ophiolite complex. And if you notice that the gabbro has the sheen of a little bit of green schist metamorphism, right. And this is very interesting, uh, that is me of course. And uh, the lava flows and pillow lavas are juxtaposition to the, to the main sections of the ophiolite and these are again andesitic. Uh, they belong to the Khardung volcanics. So, the previous workers have sampled these and uh, placed them uh, 
uh, in the supra subduction zone. Uh, unfortunately, they are not related, right? They are much, much younger than the Cretaceous Ophiolites, right? So, we have characterized this, uh, they are mostly Tholiites. We did uh, morphometric studies of these pillows, they all indicate Tholiite compositions but the metamorphism has remobilized the silica and therefore they appear to plot in the in the uh, andesites uh, they show typical tholiate uh, characters petrographically also okay they are quenched nicely subsurface uh, we did uh, preliminary geochemistry and uh, not much really we have basalts we have of course so this is exactly what I was saying. Uh, if you notice that some of the samples plot in the rhyolite andesite when actually they are true basalts. That is the effect of silica enrichment during the green schist metamorphism because a lot of chloritization has been added to the samples. Primitive mantle diagrams show you that gabbros are of two generations. The problems are with uh, with the freshness of the rock. So, we have not been able to get too much of thing. Uh, we have pyroxenites again into actually classified into olivine Webster, uh, Websterites and the other true pyroxenites and of course, the peridotites. So, that is all we could have done with the ophiolites because of their characters, their weathered characters. Uh, our studies show that these are typical mobs um, juxtapositioned with the Khardung volcanics and uh, people have dated the Khardung volcanics uh, and uh, what you call they have basically the showed their affinity to be with supra subduction zones. There is another interesting part of this ophiolite that it is juxtapositioned with, uh, with volcanoclastic sediments. Uh, they are containing radiolarian charts and therefore, marked as Cretaceous. So, we have undertaken the volcanoclastic studies. Uh, this is around 800 meter section uh, where we have unitized the whole section into, uh, into several units. The lowermost being a volcanoclastic mafic, ultra mafic debris flow. Uh, followed by a thick andesitic lava flow and followed by radiolarian charts. We have red and green varieties of radiolarian charts and of course, we have very well developed thrusted radiolarian charts over here with beautiful radiolaria indicating that they are aptian. What is interesting is in the upper part of the section, there is one 20 to 30 centimeter bed uh, which contained coarse clastics, uh, mostly uh, it is a silicrete, right. And uh, when we did the petrography, it was anomalous in the whole section. We found that probably this is stuff uh, with, uh, with volcanic glass shards, and uh, when we crushed them, we have been able to recover a good crop of zircons which we are dating. Uh, most of them are older zircons, they are not, but they have magmatic overgrowths. And the upper part again contains radiolarian charts with autochthonous limestones and they are volcanoclastics with the autochthonous limestone over here, a pelagic limestone. Sorry. Uh, they contain uh, older rock fragments, chrome diapside, then uh, chromite and of course, the puga gneisses, the fragments. So, they are derived from, from the basement and from the ophiolytic sequence. Sorry, kya ho gaya? So, the uppermost section that is Malika there standing with the pillow lavas, uh, we were younger Malika then. 
and uh, of course the radiolarian chert. So what remains to be done in this sophiolite is basically they are very good field evidences for occurrences of the mob. We still have to answer questions like why the sheeted dike complex is missing in this area. We need to take it up for other uh, geochemical work especially we do not have clinopyroxene trace elements on these and uh, we cannot do may very much uh, many things on this ophiolite. Uh, but we have been able to constrain the sedimentology of this 800 meters. They show debris flow effects to deep pelagic sediments with turbidity affinities, but we have not been able to conclusively say that they are turbidites. So, this is the part of the uh, work that we have done so far and uh, I think so I would like to listen from you more than what we have done. So, the other part of it is what uh, they are doing in spawn tank. Spawn tank is not uh, altered, it is quite high, it is very fresh, but neither has this problem. Probably it was under ice and now it is exposed, so it is weathering very fast. So, Michelle and Matthew, you have comments for me? Uh, no, there is no hypothesis, but during our mapping we have found that uh, probably the ascent of the slab during the obduction was so rapid that uh, most of the magma uh, that under I mean the partial melting products actually accumulated subplutonically and formed the varieties of gabbros because 60 to 65 percent of what we have mapped are gabbros. And therefore, we have very little effusive or or we the effusive part of it is unpreserved. That could be the alternative, but there is no real uh, and it is missing in every ophiolite. The sheeted dike complex is missing in every ophiolite whether it is Chinese, uh, Indian or from Pakistan. The sheeted dike complex is absolutely missing in, in the Himalayan context. That is probably to the rapid rates of abduction. Sorry? Because of the tectonic setting. There was no sheet like that is so true. That No. Yes, they are about 60 percent in whatever we have mapped. They are big plutons, huge. I mean, they are huge plutons. The, the partial melting is around 25 to 30 percent. That is what we are getting from the peridotypes. And within the sub, sub plutonic yeah. yes no what has happened is the previous workers have mapped whatever lavas are there uh, including the GSI and Wadia Institute they have mapped uh, these areas but uh, there are two uh, things over here that are because of the crustal shortening you have the uh, Kohistan arc that is the Kohistan arc from Pakistan with the Dras. So, you have a part of the Dras arc which is producing the Khardung volcanics, right. So, they are true andesites and andesitic lavas. You have the Dras volcanics, 
that have been added to the ophiolite. So the lavas are basically calcalkaline related to subduction, but during mapping they are juxtapositioned along with the mob. What I am finding is that less than 2 percent lavas are produced by the mob. So we have lava flows that are true, truly related to the mob, but that is less than 2 percent of the. So we have 60 to 80 percent of the section that is gabbroic. There are several pulses of gabbros. Uh, they are undated of course. Uh, they are petrographically distinct. They are geochemically distinct. We do not know isotopically how they, uh, they show up. But uh, and this is the largest ophiolite that we have. Uh, that, 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 that we have the crust and the mantle section. Okay, in, uh, in Spontang we have most of it uh, mantle section, but then again they are juxtapositioned. That is the mob mantle and the arc mantle are juxtapositioned in two, two thrust belts. But w all that we have in Nidar is this, uh, maybe with time more sections can be explored, but we have these sections and uh, we have to work within this context. But uh, like I said, uh, the absence of the sheeted dike is one physical, uh, we require a model to explain this. No, uh, that is exactly what I said because uh, we do not have the ICPMS analysis of the clinopyroxene. So I am at present doing it with thing, but I would like to see the clinopyroxene how they show up. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So we are uh, that is what, but uh, the problem is with the serpentinization. So finding a good, good CPX for ICPMS analysis is itself a problem. So, so over the 13 years we have bought in like uh, seven to eight tons of rock, and we have worked with. 30 samples. So that's that's been the problem. So so that's exactly at Handley we have good porphyroclastic uh, uh, clinopyroxenes, but there the grade of metamorphism is also high. So we are not, it is up to uh, amphibolite, upper amphib amphibolite. So we are not very comfortable using them, although we have the clinopyroxenes. In Nidar, we have green cyst, considering that the RE will not be mo mobilized, but uh, the problem is with the amount of material that we have. Yeah, we have, dunite is not a problem, dunite is, no, no, we have large, large uh, abundance. It is almost 15 to 20 percent of the section. Yes, all of them are chromiferous, no, systematically. So you have layered podiform chromites uh, at the southwestern part and they turn into disseminations towards the top. So we have one very good well constrained section, just one in the Nidar Valley. Uh, and they are intruded by these Websterite and clinopyroxenite uh, dikes. So what Michel was saying uh, in his presentation with the Trinity that we can try uh, if 
if we get a, a decent sample to do. And uh, what you said, uh, the number of samples uh, in the dew night we can increase. So maybe at every 50 meters interval we can collect dew night and see if there is any secular variations within that. Yes. The in, in the disseminations, there are no problems. They are uh, quite uh, good. In the large, massive podiforms, uh, there they have been recalibrated to, I mean, colsonite and uh, yeah. But in the disseminated varieties, the chromites are uh, well behaved. I mean, they have no problems. Sorry? No, it's moderate uh, enrichment is there. Yeah, it's around 20, 27 to 30 percent. Yeah, you have chromium. They don't exceed more than 47 in any case of whatever we have analyzed. We have analyzed 13 samples on the major oxide, but they have not exceeded 45 percent. There are some works on the on the PG of the chromites, uh, but very disseminated. So not a lot. Yes, there is a problem with that. Yeah. So we have to do with what we have at present uh, in this ophiolite. Right? I mean, yeah, it's a beautiful place actually, and uh, we camp there, so it's uh, okay. So this is the place close to. Uh, Malika's this thing, Somorari. So Somorari goes like 36, minus 36 to once we experience minus 42. Uh, Nidar is, uh, yeah, yeah. And Nidar is much protected, so the temperatures are, uh, it's less harsh in Nidar. Uh, so we, we camp in Nidar. The altitude over here is 6,000. 100 meters. If go coming to the river, it will be around 5,800. Nice, but difficult to work. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to work, and uh, uh, it requires a tough mentality because we are breaking the rock, and when we get them, they have nice specific gravities. When we come back and make the thin sections, they are serpentinized. So that uh, that's that's the part of it. So they are lucky to get uh, in Spontang very good fresh samples. But this part of it has been problematic. So, so how do we quantify this rate of spreading? I mean, because if you have to sell this hy hypothesis, Yes, I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, 
I mean, many of them are uh, inventing the sheeted dye complex always in the in the Himalayas, but they are. Yes. So what, what you say makes sense because uh, from the constraining the morphology of the pillows, uh, I didn't speak about that because it was not right. Uh, you find that the pillows are uh, spherical. Uh, they are morphometrically akin to 5 meter cube per second. Low volume eruptions. Yeah, they are low volume eruptions. And there are submarine sheets of lavas. And they are inflated, of course. Uh, with segregation vesicles. So all that, all that we discussed could be integrated saying that slow spreading rates and yeah, slow eruption rates and uh, absence of the sheeted dike complex makes sense there. Specific, yeah. Plutonic clocks, yeah. So can, can the clinopyroxenes tell us something, especially for the partial melting? Exactly, exactly. It's difficult, yeah. 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 And moreover, the texture is destroyed because of serpentinization. So you don't get any idea.
So the focus could be Gabbros. Yeah. yeah, and you can see the mineralogical difference. Yeah, they accumulate. Yeah. So yeah, it, I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Michelle, you're coming. This very short one, yeah. Pangong se. So I went via Stoke to check. Uh, no, you went the Changla se. section. Nain, yes? Changla se nahin gai main. Piche se gai? Se Piche se gai? Haan. 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 So you went through down uh, Kalsar. From hmm. Kalsar you went to hmm. this thing. So hmm. wahan pe nahin hai open. Wo jo black dikta hai. Haan. Kar do to the next. So usme boss se ite into usme dark color. Haan. Wo anti side dark side. The brown, uh, brown, color. brown color. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I was not expecting to do this, so it's far. Ah, this one. I was not sure to do to to do this, so this is why. But tomorrow, I keep for tomorrow the long one about pyroxenite. Uh, you remember pyroxenite in the mantle are not a large volume, but that should be very important for some processes. You, we will show tomorrow. Today, we just show you that when I did my PhD. I was focusing on the xenolith from Kerguelen, you remember, mostly the mantle xenolith. But the very interesting thing is also we find some 
uh, very unusual generally from uh, an oceanic setting, they were massive granuli. So f uh, found when we found this kind of sample in an oceanic setting where people think that all the mamma comes from, from the mantle, you know, granuli, people are thinking continents. So it was the first time we discovered that we can have, I insist, is mafic granulite. Huh? It's not acid granulite, it's mafic granulite. We will show they come from basaltic, uh, basaltic product. So this is why I just, ah, it's not working. Ah, of course, if it's not working, if I don't connect this, if I, I have to the talk for me, sorry. Okay. But I did my job during my PhD and the beginning of the postdoc. This is why the name of Sorezan already is here. So it was the first time we, we have a look at the cross mantle boundary beneath the Kerguelen Plume Ridge system. So because we find this unusual sample, I remember, and just to remember you, Kerguelen on the top of the Kerguelen Plume, the uh, Kerguelen Plateau, Oceanic Plateau, the second largest oceanic plateau in the world. Uh, after the Otong Java, with a large production of melt, and you can probably compare to the Deccan Trap is a continental setting. Uh, uh, but here you are in an in in oceanic setting. So the south, uh, southern part of the Indian Ocean. I don't remember you, the, you know the, the history. Huh? Uh, first uh, Iceland uh, type setting, and after an Iowan type setting. So large uh, number of uh, xenolith localities. Uh, mostly uh, basaltic trap, you remember, with some volcano-plutonic complexes made of cyanide and this kind of stuff. But one interesting thing, uh, in the um, 80s, some uh, geophysicists, they did some uh, seismologic study in Kerguelen. And they, they, you know, they, they, they came with, with this kind of uh, result. So a very thick oceanic crust, you look. Uh, you, you know that a typical oceanic crust is 6 to 8 kilometers. Here you have up to 18 and sometimes more than 20 kilometers thick. But it's a typical, but for them, for geophysicists, it's not a continental crust, it's an oceanic crust because you have the typical layer 2. Uh, layer 2 is equivalent to the volcanic, uh, the volcanic layer in, in the oceanic crust. The layer 3, the gabbroic layer. But you know the difference with the uh, normal oceanic crust, it's just they are very thick, they are thicker. But a very unusual feature for the geophysicists, they find for the VP, uh, the, the VP uh, uh, speed, uh, for, for uh, against depth here. And at this depth, you know, uh, close to 18 to 21, 22, they find this kind of unusual speed for VP. And it was not a, a, a job, a sharp move. They discovered that you have a transition zone and you go progressively from the typical speed, VP speed in the crust to the typical one from the mantle, but you need few kilometers to do this. So the main result were very thick oceanic crust and a transition zone, no very typical move. Two hypotheses at that time for them, uh, sampartinized layer here, or what they call at that time a uh, magmatic underplating uh, process by basaltic melt. So they, they, they did not know the way to distinguish. So when they came the discovery of the Xenolith locality, you remember this, this photo, a lot of peridotite, uh, of course, half borgate mostly, but you know somewhere, sometimes we have this white, this small one, uh, and we were thinking about crustal gabbro, and, uh, and that's it. Some, uh, hello, yes, Ber Garnet Bering, uh, sorry, because I did this talk uh, 15 years ago, you know, uh, I didn't practice yesterday. So just uh, remember also what we have also Garnet, uh, Garnet Bering clean up and I think, yes. And we are going to this, you know, a part of uh, the mantle large borgite, we have Garnet pyroxenite, but we already talked about this a few days uh, before, but with unusual kind of rocks, you know, they are uh, not, they look like gabbro, this one, but you know, it's very well uh, equilibrated, and in fact, it's a, it's a pyroxene granulite now. And this one, even in some part, you have garnet here, surrounding sapphirine, it's a typical metamorphic, uh, metaphoric mineral from the granulitic faces, 
mostly in, in mafic granulite, and here in the middle, a spinel. And you know, these rocks have the same characteristic, chemical characteristic, that this one is a pure cumulate, this one, you know, it's a, it's a websterite, olivine, orthopyroxene, and they are, they, they are part of the same uh, family. In, in fact, they, are, uh, they have characteristic of cumulates from tolytic transitional basalt, but you saw we start to distinguish the uh, boundary between the magmatic origin of these rocks and their metamorphic evolution to pure granulite. Some uh, you know, focus, you have also some reaction typical of the granulitic, uh, the granulitic faciès. Orthopyroxene plus plagioclase give you garnet plus a second type of clinopyroxene. Uh, they are very fresh because they are very young, of course. So, as I told you, the characteristic, the comical characteristic of all of this stuff, I mean, this one with the garnet, but the one, the websteritic, they have the same kind of, for example, rare filament pattern in wall rock, you know, typical, typically flat with the big uh, positive aluminum europium, and in fact, we interpret this as cumulates from tolytic transitional melt, and inside the cumulate, you can have websterite. Sometimes we have magmatic, mag magmatic lherzolite. Uh, it's a magmatic rocks made of olivine and two pyroxene, but it's not coming from the mantle. And we have, in fact, in the detail, we have three main types of what I call at that time the tip two xenolith from Kerguelen. You know, cumulates from tolytic melt. Here it's more from tolytic also, but it's more of frozen melt. Uh, it's a tip three. In fact, it's a rocks made of clinopyroxene plagioclase in menite with garnet around in menite coming from the metamorphic reaction. And we have also, as I show you, you remember the garnet bearing pyroxenite, we have cumulate segregates from alkaline melt within the mantle. It's normal to find a lot of <coughs> magmatic produ product beneath the archipelago because you have a very long history of magmatic production, remember, with tolytic transitional history at the beginning and the alkaline history at the end. Uh, and, and even we have uh, evidence of uh, historical uh, activities. So, remember the type 1 were mantle xenolith, the type 2 are in fact metamagmatic rocks coming from the two main uh, magmatic activities, the tolytic transitional one for this type 2, two type, two, this one is belonging to this one, and alkaline cumulates. Isotopic, I am not an isotope, you know, you know, I use isotopic here. But in a simple diagram, neodymium against strontium uh, isotopic ratio, you see that the type 2, you know, they plot within the different field from, uh, from the magmatic uh, uh, rocks from Kerguelen, plutonics or volcanics. So it's the same conclusion from with the trace element. We have, in fact, cumulates from all the magma from from Kerguelen, going from the tolytic magma here, uh, uh, their uh, composition close to, to the end morb field and to is the Indian ridges morb uh, field also, up close to the EM1, and you remember the talk of uh, Mathieu, e EM1 is defined by the Kerguelen lava. Okay? So everything is clear, even if we are surprised to find metamorphic rocks, uh, uh, mafic granulite, in fact, these mafic granulite are uh, Re-equilibration products from magmatic rocks coming from the, uh, the melt we find at the surface of Kerguelen. Some example, you know, websterite with olivine and some spinel. And these spinel, in fact, are not typical chromite. They are already rich in aluminium. This is the first evidence that probably you, your rocks are not coming from the surface and from uh, very low in the crust, but they're coming from deeper part of the crust. Because typically, when you are in a uh, close to, to the surface, your, your, uh, your magmatic spinel is more rich in, chromite, in chromium, and if you go down, you enrich in, uh, in aluminium. It's working for uh, magmatic rocks, huh? and I'm not uh, speaking about metamorphic rocks. So we did this because, as you remember, we can use garnet and orthopyroxene to estimate the pressure. So we have the possibility to estimate uh, with the assemblages, huh, because we have garnet bearing, bearing rocks, the, the, the temperature and pressure uh, by doing geothermobarometry from uh, the xenolith, here temperature, here pressure, so the depth. And in fact, what we propose is like that, you know, this arrow are the hypothesis we defend at that time, that our 
uh, granulite, metagranulite, and all the, the metamagnetic rocks are in fact uh, products from uh, partial melting of the mantle. You form basalt, you put your basalt at depth. You know, I, I report here the, the pressure interval from uh, the geophysicist result for the transition zone. And in fact, you can explain everything because you are just Re normal re-equilibration of magma kick rocks within the metamorphic field, you know, pyroxene granulite. Remember, it's just mafic granulite. You know, the garnet granulite field, because we have garnet granulite. The pyroxene granulite, I show you one. But we had also evidence of uh, low pressure granulite, because in some sample, we have the typical reaction, olivine plus plagioclase done to pyroxene plus spinel. And it's working also for granulite, and it gives you the exact range of pressure. So we propose this kind of arrow because we were not sure that we have only temperatures going down. Why? Because for us, during this stage, we were at the beginning of the formation of the archipelago, the tolytic transitional time. So after that, you had, again, a, a huge production of alkaline melt, giving you a few kilometers of uh, thickness of the crust more. So this is why we put this proposition to increase a little bit the pressure. At the same time, you, you, you decrease the temperature. Okay? But it doesn't change too much the, 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 the model. It's just because we are taking into account the, the fact that after the, the tolytic transitional stage, we have a long alkaline stage in intraplaque setting with a huge production of melt put at the surface and probably your uh, your uh, your product, for example, your magmatic product at the surface here, uh, between the, the, the cross and the mantle, probably re by going a little bit down and by uh, losing temperature. Okay? This is, uh, the, this is also published. Uh, it, it was in 98. Yes, it, yes, it's a long time ago. So evidence of reaction. You know, I told you, typical one, olivine. is not a, a, a mantle rocks, huh? It's a websterite. At the beginning, it's a plagioclase olivine websterite. So you have evidence of olivine here, plagioclase. In here, you have a corona for topiroxene around the, the olivine, and a symplectite fixture. Symplectite is because you have clinopiroxene and spinel growing together. Okay? And if you look the garnet, uh, the plagioclase is not feeling well. Hein? It's, it's zoning, it's zoned, and you have a lot of small crystal of spinel inside and because it's reacting to form this new assemblage. And this is a typical reaction to go from the low pressure gra uh, mafic granulite field to the pyroxene granulitic field, okay? What I did also to confirm our hypothesis made mostly by petrological and geochemical results, <coughs> sorry, when I went to Australia, uh, I had the opportunity to go to the Australian National University in Canberra because Sue uh, is a good friend of uh, Jan Jackson, and he's a petrophysicist. So we, were, we, we had the idea to measure, uh, to measure and to calculate uh, the speed velocity we have in our sample. To measure its uh, acoustic, uh, you know, you, we, we do, uh, I'm not a specialist on this, I, I did this uh, in two years, a long time ago, but in fact, uh, the equivalent of your VP are acoustic speed. So in, in your lab, you can measure the, 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 the speed, the acoustic speed within your sample, within a granulite, hein? and after you have calculation to, to, uh, to be able to compare with the VP a geophysicist had on the field. So for some sample, you know, we do two methods, uh, the measurement in the lab, and Jan did some calculation using the physical properties of the mineral we have in our granulite with the model composition. I don't want to go to, to too much in detail because I probably will uh, tell you some big, mi big mi mi mistake because I am not a petrophysicist, but he did two methods. For some sample, you know, here we have good agreement between the two methods. For few of them, it's not working very well. But, for, you know, for this well, we, we, are, we, will, we were able to find a good agreement between the two, the two kind of, uh, of uh, between the measurement and the calculation. And so you already s see some results. Look, remember the, the diagram I show you at the beginning? We are between here 7.3, 7.7. You know, the typical range uh, the geophysicists find in the transition zone that they call the progressive mode. 
So we propose this model to link, I, I, I already told you that it's very important to link geophysics and geochemistry and petrology. Here, the result from geophysicists. Here, we, the model we propose for Kerguelen. Remember, layer two, layer three, uh, progressive MO, uh, called transition zone, and the upper mountain. What we propose, in fact, we, we explain this transition by the underplatting processes of magma. A lot of uh, seals, probably, at this time, and your seals at the beginning were basaltic product, mostly from tolytic and uh, transitional basalt. Uh, but you, you, you see the, the, the depth? If you re-equilibrate this product, you will fall within, in this one, in will the pyroxene granulitic field. And we, form, we will form the, the, the massive granulite with only plagioclase and the two pyroxene. And after, you have a lot of seal going down. And in fact, what we propose, and going up to the garnet field, the garnet uh, granulite field here, uh, because you, you need to have a pressure more than 1.1, uh, 1.6 gigapascal. So we were able to explain also that probably within the mantle, you have a lot of seals also at the, in, the, in the shallower part of your mantle, because you can't explain granulite granulitic xenolith, uh, garnet granulitic xenolith here. Here you are in the typical PT condition of the uh, pyroxene granulite. So we have to involve the occurrence of seals, of pockets, of uh, bodies, of, of garnet uh, uh, granulite coming from, from the equilibration of tolytic transitional melts directly within the mantle and down to probably uh, depth to about uh, 40, 45, up to 40 kilometers, and after you go to your mantle. Okay? So we were explaining uh, the hypothesis of the, we were confirming one of the hypotheses of the geophysicist, the one with magmatic underplating, and we tell the geophysicist, you can forget the, the serpentine, uh, uh, the serpentine uh, hypothesis because we never find a serpentine uh, xenolith, and we find this uh, nice rock, so probably it's a good explanation. So after that, we like the big model uh, in petrology and geology. We propose this evolution, putting everything together. I remember the, the Iceland stage, the Hawaiian stage, what we know with the Xenolith. We propose this kind of train going from the beginning, you know, around 40 million years ago, uh, location close, uh, close to the South Indian ridge. You start to interact between the plume, Kerguelen plume, and the ridge. You form the tolytic transitional melt. You progressively form your underplating here of tolytic melt. You move by probably it's a jump of the ridge. Uh, the the geodynamic, uh, geodynamician, they like to, to play uh, when they can explain uh, normal evolution of ridge. They involve a jump of ridge, but it's sometimes difficult to understand, but I trust them. So progressively, we have to remember our archipelago is going progressively to a typical intraplex setting. And we, the, mag the magmatic, we evolve to alkaline melt. So this is why we put this light color here. It's probably, you ha we have evidence with uh, the collection of the of occurrence of garnet pyroxenite. So this is why we, we, do, we draw this kind of bodies. And this comes from the previous study focusing on the crustal rocks. We have plutonic rocks in Kerguelen. I told you, sienite, and they are mostly alkaline. So this is why we, we, we propose this model we published in, uh, in, in uh, you know, in 97, in contribution. So to explain, to have uh, an ID, uh, is not the, the probably, uh, when, uh, Mathieu told you this morning, we are trying to understand the Earth with our small brain, in fact. So this is just a model. This is a model that fit at this time the best, the better, all the data coming from all the community focusing on Kagala. So I think it's finished, no? Yeah. Now you know, we have a last uh, nice picture. It's a uh, simple tight, but this one, if we spline the pyroxene, spline uh, the pyroxene and sapphirine. And in fact, we, we, it took us a few months to understand this, because you have to remember, we were in a pure oceanic setting. We, we came back with rocks, we were under the microscope, and sapphirine is not a very common one. Sapphirine is very rare on the Earth. So we were looking for a mineral between the spinel and the garnet. 
And in fact, we were very lucky because at that time, we, don't have a, uh, we did not have an electron microprobe in Saint Etienne. We had to go to, to Clermont-Ferrand. And close to the probe, we were a professor I had uh, when I was a student. He's a metamorphic petrologist, and he did uh, his PhD on Madagascar, on granulite from Madagascar. So uh, I analyzed my, my, my grain. I came to his office. I said, uh, you have an idea of uh, this mineral? He said, uh, because we are not a transition phase between garnet and spinel, you know. We were <laughs> he said, bah, it's a sapphirine. It's obvious. Ah, OK, it's obvious. Sapphirine, it's... Um, let's say, uh, less than 20% of silica, a lot of alumina, uh, 50, 60, a little bit of uh, ca calcium and magnesium, that's it. So, uh, they said, it's, it's impossible. It's in the middle of the ocean. It's in the typical setting, oceanic setting. And we, we are talking about the granulitic. And it was the beginning of the, of the study. And after, uh, we went like this. So, to end this, when you don't know something, ask to your colleague. Even if it's a petrologist, uh, you, you need to have colleagues around you to understand very well the things. So this is the end. It was a very quick one. And tomorrow, I will go back to menthol and to pyroxenite. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was a little bit quick because I, no, I finished twice because I didn't look at this since I was in France. You know, I Do you have a question? Two? Yeah, but the problem in Deccan, I mean, people will think about straight to co continental stuff. Uh, in fact, it was difficult at the beginning to understand, but uh, we were very lucky because uh, it, wa it was the middle of... Uh, uh, well, it's, it's not a typical oceanic crust, huh? it's a thick one. This is probably why we have granulite. Uh, previously, some Japanese uh, scientists, they find some what they call backcard granulite, a long time ago in Japan, uh, and they were thinking these granulite come also from a thick oceanic crust, but it was, it was a oceanic crust uh, in an arc setting. This one is in the middle of the ocean with a huge uh, magmatic activity linked to the plume. They are very fresh, but they are only, yes, I insist, they are only uh, not typical granulite, they are massy granulite, mostly because they are a basaltic product, in fact. But we had big discussion with uh, Nobushimizu, you know, because he was looking for a continental fragment somewhere. And so when we arrived with the granulites, oh, yes, yes, we have the fragment. Uh, we did the isotope. Did you see the isotopes? They are not continental. The isotope is purely uh, the oceanic. Uh, so he was not very happy. Uh, so we have to publish quickly because he was uh, you know, looking to publish his result. Uh, well. It was a very good, uh, but it's just because with the xenolith, if you are lucky, because only with the mantle, you know, you, you remember the mantle, it's uh, Arsbogat, Spinel Arsbogat, and you have metasomatis. Uh, but this one was a big discovery, and it was the evidence that we can have very thick oceanic crust. And what we think now, but we have to, to work on this, we think that probably if you have, uh, I remember you, uh, Kerguelen Archipelago is 100 kilometers to 100. I think this kind of stuff is probably the beginning of a transitional crust between a typical oceanic one and maybe some continental after. Because it will be probably difficult to, to, in a subduction zone to put this down. It's full of granulite. It's full of uh, sienite, uh, plutonic bodies. So the density is probably low. And the mantle, remember the mantle beneath, is typically Asburgite. Remember, the Asburgite have a lower density than the Azolite. So it's probably why, remember also Lear, Lear, I was talking about the Ronton Java Plateau, and the Ronton Java Plateau is uh, coming and stops the subduction because it's going to the subduction zone as a big plateau, probably with a thick crust, thick acrylic crust like this one, and it's blocking the subduction. And so now you can imagine if you block the subduction, you can melt this new crust, and if you melt this new crust, this is the definition of a continental crust, is the melting of an oceanic crust. So we were thinking about some protolithes Continental protolite, uh, probably the same they, they, they propose for the Archean time, you know, with a large plume, a super plume, and you know, people fighting between the origin of the continental cross from subduction zone and from plume. But maybe they are right altogether, but it was not at the same time, not in the same setting. But Kerguelen is a good young setting to give you the opportunity to have a natural lab to, to test uh, this hypothesis. This is why I would like to, to show you a little bit 
more than uh, the typical mantle intenolith, uh, remember, 90% of the metasomatic uh, nice paragenesis we find in mantle exenolith, uh, I'm not, not talking about the kimberlite, huh, but in basalt, are coming from the late, late uh, magmatic activity, alkaline, and so this kind of uh, stuff also is very interesting for, for our thing. Thanks. No more questions? So we go, we come for uh, our last talk tomorrow with Mathieu and tomorrow night. Thank you. I told you 20 minutes, but I took no uh, more than half an hour. <laughs> Sorry, I'm too Latin. I'm so, I like to speak. <laughs> Well, I was thinking to this this morning. This morning yeah. I said it's, it's short, but it's nice also. Yeah. Hmm? You want an exam for this afternoon? No. <laughs>